Hello, brothers, this is Christ. Okay. Words to no profit. We're going to talk about the word Christian. I've had uh, people get on to me, brothers, this is Christ, about using the word Christian. And we, as, as Bible believers, not Bible, well, because Bible believers isn't in there. Um, church, I've heard you've heard Church of the Living God. Okay, we'll talk about that. Church of the Living God. Uh, saints, uh, brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, washed in the blood. Uh, believers in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, saved sinners. There's so many terms that we should not be using the term Christian. Okay, first, as we get into this study, you can realize Christian in the Bible is used three times. It's used as a label, a title. I use those two tonight. A label, a title. It's not a term. It's a label. It's a title. But there's three requirements when it comes to using the word Christian. There's three requirements that even I haven't been using properly. So I just wanted to throw it out there, what God has shown me in the scriptures, the three requirements when it comes to using the word Christian, the title Christian, make sure that we're using Christian right, and is it okay for someone who's saved, a saved sinner, to use the word Christian? Well, I'm going to throw it right out there and say, yes, it is. First thing you're going to hear people say, well, in a teaching, in a teaching. No, I can use the word Christian. Uh, Peter did. Okay, Paul did. Maybe be careful. Remember, Paul's the one writing this down. When he writes it down and writes down, someone called me a Christian, and he doesn't correct him, he doesn't say anything negative about it, then why are we? Be very careful. But let's get into the three, because it makes a lot more sense if we can get into the three main foundations for how to use Christian and why Christian is used. Okay. So let's look at the definition. Remember, Webster's, I got the book over there. What, and then I've got the Bible program right here. Um, the Webster's 1820 Dictionary, remember, it's not our foundation. This is our foundation. But it's not wrong to use it and say, okay, does this back up the definition of the Webster's 1820 Dictionary. And I believe it's kind of close. Definition. A real disciple of Christ. Someone who follows Jesus Christ. Someone who believes in Jesus Christ. If you believe in Jesus Christ, you're going to follow Him. If you believe Jesus is the capital L Lord, the capital K King, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, you're going to obey Him. You're going to, it's someone who lives, that's what a disciple of Christ is, someone who lives according to the commandments of Jesus Christ. Okay. One of the things, I'm get, probably getting ahead of myself in here, it says in here, Ye are my friends, if you do whatsoever, I command you. What does it mean to be a Christian? According to this definition, it says a disciple of, G of Christ. And we're going to get into here. One who believes in the truths of the Christian religion and studies to follow the example and obey the precepts of Christ. That's their definition. But they left out one very important one, and that is one who suffers for Jesus Christ. Remember, in the intro, you don't suffer because you are striving about a gnat, trying to swallow a camel and um, striving, what is it, straining at a gnat and trying to swallow a camel. You're striving about to words to no profit. You're casting pearls before swine, uh, that which is holy among the dogs, the holy commands of God. You're trying to force people to live a Christian life that aren't Christians. Okay, what's going to happen? You're, they're going to turn around and rend you. You're not suffering for Jesus Christ. You're suffering because you're straying from this book. All we can do is preach Jesus Christ to them. Preach sin to them. Let them know that they're sinners. They don't need much... that. It's, you know, they have to have sorrow for that sin. They don't need much um, convincing that they're sinners. What they need to be told is they need to be told the consequences and that they need to have sorrow for those sins. That's what we're here for. I had sorrow in my heart for the sins that I committed against God. Even in the life of a Christian, I still have sorrow for my sins when I fail the Lord. Do you? Mm -hmm. 1 Peter 1.16, not turn here, but 1 Peter 1.16, because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. This is Peter saying, for it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. Remember, don't cast out which is holy among the dogs? 
A Christian, according to the definition here, is a disciple of Jesus Christ, someone who obeys the commandments of God. Does the Bible kind of back this up? Yes, it does. 1 Corinthians 11.1 1, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. We read about Peter. Say, be ye holy as I am holy. Now, this is Paul. 1 Corinthians 11 and 1, same thing. Uh, Philippians 3, 17. Brethren, be ye followers together of me, and mark them which walk, so you have us for an example. When someone looks at someone who claims to believe in Jesus Christ, there should be a changed life, a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Love not the world, neither the things in the world. Okay? Uh, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. There's supposed to be a change in your life that people look at you and go, what? Because you obey Jesus Christ, you're a Christian. And we're going to get to that. Um, if you want to turn to, uh, in your Bibles, turn to Acts 11.26. That's where we're going to start with the word study. John 14, 23 says, Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words. And my Father will love him, and we will come and make our abode with him. To change life. The evidence that you believe in Jesus Christ, that you love Jesus Christ, is the life that you're living for him. Are you living for Jesus Christ? Are you part of this false, fake Christianity that I was defending, saying this is worth fighting for in the intro? That false Christianity is that I can love the world. I can be conformed to the world. I can love sin. I can love things of the flesh. Worldliness. And just call myself a Christian. No. True evidence is someone who's, who, who, by that definition, is a Christian, is someone who follows Jesus Christ. He says that's a sin. Get it out of your life. You get it out of your life. You say that's a sin. I've talked about this, Jesus Christ, in my testimony. I've talked about this in other studies where I come across something in my life that I love and just really, you know, fleshly fun. It's fun, man. Fun is flesh. Flesh is fun. Um, and God goes, you know what? That ain't right. And you look at it and you go, this is an attitude. You can have this attitude as a Christian. Go, oh, man, but, oh, Lord, I love this. Lord, really? Lord? Your word says it's wrong. Lord, help me to get rid of it. Help my eyes to change and how I see it. Help my attitude to change, Lord. Help me get it out of my life. You say it's wrong, it's wrong. That's the attitude of someone who's truly saved and born again. When you have people stand there trying to defend sin, defend sin, defend sin, that's why I always question red flag. You know, it's a red flag. Is that person really born again? Are they following Jesus Christ? Or are they still following their flesh? The Bible in Romans chapter 8 talks about it. Go pause it and go read it. talks about being carnally minded, walking after the flesh, or being spirit, capital S, spiritually minded. You have the Holy Spirit that comes in. What we read there? My Father and I will come and make our abode with Him. And then Jesus talks about sending the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, to be with you. I will be with you, Jesus says. And then He talks about the Holy Spirit being with you. Mm -hmm. Evidence of that Holy Spirit in you is your attitude towards the Word of God. Are you hiding it in your heart and living it? The Bible says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? Be separate from the world by taking heed thereto according to thy word. 1 Thessalonians 1 6 says, And ye became followers of us and of the Lord. What Paul say? You follow me as I am of Christ. So when you're following me, you're following the Lord. That's what Paul's saying. Remember, Paul was an apostle. I don't say be followers of me as I am of, of Christ. I'm to set the example that I'm following Paul's example, showing that I'm following Jesus Christ. But I tell you to follow Jesus Christ. Follow his word. Follow the example that Paul set. Okay? And of the Lord, having received the word and much affliction and joy of the Holy Ghost. Affliction. We're going to get into that. One of the main definitions of why you use the word Christian is you have someone who suffers for Jesus Christ. 
And you don't suffer just for just saying, I'm a Christian. You suffer because of the life that you're living. It's going to set you apart. You're going to lose family and friends. You're going to uh, be persecuted. Your life is going to be harder than a lot of people's lives that just cave in and compromise and just go with the flow. Your life's going to be a lot harder. It's going to be lonelier. There's going to be suffering when you're an actual Christian according to the scriptures. 1 Thessalonians 2.14 reads, For ye, brethren, became followers of the church of God, which is in Judea, are in Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered light things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews. And as we're going to find out, the term Chris, Christian, I believe, it came from the Gentiles. I can't be 100% on this because I'm not gonna, I don't want to get, here I'm telling you, not to add to God's word. And yet, it's, I don't want to add to God's word. But I think that, you know, the Hebrews would call us heretics. And that's what the Hebrews called us Bible believers. God-fearing, Bible-believing, God-fearing, uh, saved sinners, saints, brothers and sisters in Christ, washed in the blood, changed life, new creatures in Christ Jesus. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Okay. Um, and then when it got to the Gentile side, they're the ones that said, oh, those are just Christians. They're part of this cult or sect. They're just Christians. I kind of believe that. I just want you to know I'm not acting like I don't believe that. But I have to stand for the Word of God and what the Word of God actually says. So let's read it. Okay, Acts chapter 11. Turn to Acts chapter 11. Well, what does the Word of God say? Is my belief backed by the Word of God, or is it just my opinion? Well, I'll jump ahead and just tell you. It's my opinion. It's not backed. Okay. All these years people keep saying, Acts 11.26, let's read it first. And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people, much people. It says, with the church and taught much people. Here it is. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. And if you keep reading, that's all it says. And then you keep reading 27. And these days came prophets from Jerusalem unto Antioch. And there stood up one of them named Agabus, and that goes into a whole other story. But notice what it said there. It said they were called, the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. Now I have heard brethren say, and I have even said it, that the word Christian has been and is being misused by the world today. Okay. But the whole point is, is it a sin for Christians to use the word Christ, uh, Christians to use the word uh, Bible believers, save sinners, brothers and sisters in Christ, you and me, brothers and sisters in Christ. Is it a sin for us to use the word Christian? Now, first, here's the first definition of the, how Christian the word Christian is used. First of all, I keep pointing out it says, and the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. Does it say who called them Christians first? No. Just that they were called Christians first. I was called Philip first in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. Well, you know that the, the lost world. Uh, I didn't say that. I didn't say who called me Philip first. Now I can tell you, since I know, I can tell you that um, my name, Philip, my grandmother wanted me to be named Philip after Philip in the Bible. Okay. And my family, my mom, my dad, my, my family, were the first ones to call me Philip in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. But if all I say is I was first called Philip in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, that doesn't really tell you who called me Philip first, just that I was called Philip first. So one thing to remember is try not to be like those people that like to add to Scripture. Okay, I, I, like I said, I have my belief. You know, but it's not backed by Scripture. It just says they were called. They came together as the church, the body of Christ. 
believers, and they were called Christian. What if a Christ, they called each other Christians? Saved sinners were calling each other Christians. I can't say that, because it doesn't say that. But at the same time, I can't say the lost worlds are the ones calling them Christians. It doesn't say that. Okay, That they were called Christians first. Now here's the second thing that you have to get out of this. Or not get out of it. <laughs> okay, The people are like to add to Scripture. Notice here, is it positive or is it negative? Neither. It's not positive or negative. It's just a statement of fact. It's a statement of truth. Christians, neither positive, it's, never said, it's not said in a positive light, and it's not said in a negative light. It's just stating a fact. But what we really need to get from this is this. I don't sit here, and I've made this mistake, I don't sit here and call myself a Christian. Go ahead. One of the things, the definitions and how the word Christian is used, it's something you are called. They look at you, as we're going to get into the other two definitions, they look at you and they see that you're living the life of Jesus Christ, you're following Jesus Christ, and you're suffering for Jesus Christ, and they look at you and go, you are a Christian. You are called a Christian. You don't call yourself a Christian. It's something you are called. It's something they were called. Mm -hmm. Like, Philip, that's my name. I can tell people my name is Philip. But I don't call myself Philip, you know? You know I, I use the word I, or me. Okay, I'm going to go over here. I don't say talk about myself like they say in the third person. Philip's going to go over here. No. I am going to go over here. Mm -hmm. So, I just want to throw that out there. Is it wrong to use the term entitled Christian. No. So why is this big push, we're going to get into it, why is this big push making out brother in a fight and over using the word Christian? Christian. Why are you doing this? I've done this for words that aren't in Scripture. But Christian is in Scripture. Okay, turn to the second time it's used. We see there the first definition is, is it's a, something that you were called. That's the thing that I tell you, Brother Jesus Christ, that you really need to get down with that. Not that it's positive, not that it's negative, that's people adding to the Word of God, not who called them, lost person or saved person. It's just that they were called. It's just stating a fact. They were called. That's what we need to be fighting for. That it's something that you are called. The reason I say that is when we get into the next two parts, the professing Christian world that misuses the, the title and the term Christian, they like to call themselves Christian. Remember what we talked about, about defending the true plan of salvation? There's a lot of people that want a free pass to heaven. A, they want free passes to heaven. And what I mean by free passes, they don't want to repent. They don't want to have to give up sin after salvation, after God saves them. They don't want to live God's way. They don't want to live a life of Christ. They just want that free pass. So they want that title Christian so they can, you know, deceive themselves. The Bible talks about de de deceiving and being deceived. They deceive themselves and they deceive others. I'm going to heaven when they're on their way to hell to burn for all eternity. Okay? The second reason is, is why this is so important that they're called Christians is because the world as a whole, I mean, God has titles. God's into titles. Uh, we have capital C Christian is a title. Okay, it's capitalized. It's a title. But the lost world also loves titles. They love it. And they want that title. Well, you want it, and then you need to go through the true plan of salvation to get it. You need to live a life of Christ to get it. There's some Christians that fall away that they don't look like Christians. They're not acting like Christians. And they shouldn't be called Christians. Not that they're lost and on their way to hell, but they shouldn't be called Christians if you're not living a life of Christ. If you're not suffering for Jesus Christ. But it's something that you are called. And the reason that the lost world, the, the fake organized religion out there, false Christianity as we say, the reason we get so frustrated, this is what we fight for. The false Christianity out there likes to call themselves Christian. Now I've slipped up and I've said, you know, that I am a Christian but 
These people love the title Christian, Christian, I'm a Christian, and they call themselves a Christian. I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian. If you've got to say I'm a Christian over and over and over, what you're doing is you're trying to deceive people into believing that you're a Christian. You shouldn't have to say I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian over and over and over to try to prove to the people around you that you believe in the real Jesus Christ and that you follow Jesus Christ. Now today, because Christian keeps being misused by all these people, I'm a Christian that say it a million times to deceive themselves. One way to deceive yourself and to deceive other people is you do repetition. You repeat something over and over and over and over until you start believing it and you start getting other people to believe it. Okay? That's one of the steps to, of lying and deceiving people. You repeat something over and over and over and over and over and over. That's why traditions of men can be very dangerous. Culture, heritage, it's something that's repeated over and over and over and over and over and over. It doesn't line up with scripture. Right. So what we get from this as, Christ, as true Christians, Bible-believing, God-fearing men and women, brothers and sisters of Christ, is that it's something that you're called. You don't call yourself a Christian, it's something that you are called. I can call the body of Christ Christians as a whole. It's something I'm calling, but when I say it, I'm not saying it as a title, like you just get this title you can wear across your shirt saying Christian. How many times do you get so much paraphernalia? This is a King James Bible. Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth, John 17, 17. Um, but you get paraphernalia, a lot of paraphernalia out there when it has to with the word Christian. Because they have to wear something on that says they're a Christian. Because when you look at them, there's no difference between them and the lost world. And that's where we're going to get into the next one. Acts 26, 28. Paul gets called a Christian. Why? Because he was separate from the world. We keep reading these verses. These are memory verses. If you don't have them memorized, try to get them memorized. But it says, Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Love not the world, neither the things in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. There's supposed to be distinction between someone who follows Jesus Christ, the real Jesus Christ, and someone who rejects Jesus Christ. But today, the word, the term, the title Christian, the term Christian is used for anything and everything. You can look like the world, act like the world, laugh at the world's jokes, and call yourself. Now I'm doing this way. Call yourself. Because remember, it doesn't say you call yourself. It's something someone calls you. But you can call yourself a Christian and still look like the world. There's no distinction. There's no separation. That's what we need to fight, brothers and Christ. When someone says Christian, you need to set throats and set these. These are the three definitions of Christian. Something you called. It means that you live for Jesus Christ. You're obeying Him. The, the changed life. You're living your life for Jesus Christ every day. And you're suffering for it. Those are the three things. I'm getting ahead of myself. Acts 26, 28. How do we know this? Paul is set apart from the world. And Agrippa, King Agrippa, he sees this. He sees there's a distinction, there's a separation. Acts 26, 28. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Paul is persuading him to get saved. Now I can't say Paul never used the word Christian. But I can't say he used the word Christian. This is King Agrippa saying it. That almost persuadeth me to be a Christian. Paul is speaking and his life lines up with his words. He's got a profession of faith and he's living it. He's in chains. He's suffering. <laughs> he's suffering for Jesus Christ. All three things are there. The people are calling him a Christian. This is a King Agrippa that's calling him a Christian, saying, Oh, as thou persuadest me to be a Christian. And as we're going to keep reading, like, like you are, is what King Agrippa is saying. So King Agrippa is the one saying that Paul's a Christian. He's being called it. It's because he has a profession, and his words line up with his deeds. And because his words line up with his deeds, he's in chains. He's suffering for Jesus Christ. 
Now let's see Paul's reaction. See, uh, here's my thing with some of the brethren's reactions out there. The reaction is, is Paul drilled Kring Agrippa and said, no, I'm not a Christian. Christian's a bad term. It's a lost world term. And we don't like that term. We're not going to use that term. Is that Paul's reaction? No. What's Paul's reaction? Verse 29. And Paul said, I went to God that not only thou, but also all that hear me this day. Paul said, I don't only want you to be a Christian. I want everybody that hears me here to become a Christian. Doesn't sound like Paul really hates that term Christian. and It's a negative term. We should have nothing to do with that term. Doesn't sound like it. Paul took it for God's glory. We're bo both almost and altogether such as I am except these bonds. Okay? We understand, brothers and sisters, I understand that when you truly get saved and born again, you're going to suffer for Jesus Christ. But I don't wish suffering upon my brothers and sisters in Christ. From the lost world, the arguments that are going on among the body of Christ, fighting over things that aren't worth fighting over, the backbiting and whispering. A great man of God that I loved, a mentor, he's really gotten into backbiting and whispering, and he promotes backbiting and whispering. Right? Causing, you know, suffering among the body of Christ. Causing division among the body of Christ. I'm not for that. Paul's not for that. He wants people to get saved. Whatever the cost, he wants you to get saved. There's nothing in this world that's worth preventing you from becoming a Christian, according to the Word of God. There's nothing in this world. Okay. We're both almost, because what does the Bible talk about? Paul talks about how you plant seeds. I've planted Apollos is watered, but God gives the increase. God gives the increase. So almost, he's talking about, I planted a seed. And it really starts getting people. It starts gnawing on their conscience. It starts gnawing on their heart. The truth. Okay. But we see here, Paul was okay with the word Christian because Agrippa was using it properly. Now we see, brothers and sisters in Christ, today the reason we kind of get upset at the word Christian and it's justified is because the lost world is misusing it. It's no longer something you're called, it's something you call yourself. And because you call yourself, you can call yourself it enough times that you can deceive people into thinking you are because your life doesn't have to line up with the Word of God. You don't have to actually follow the real Jesus Christ and His commandments and the changed life be an ambassador for Jesus Christ, to live for Jesus Christ, keep your eyes on Jesus Christ every day. Oh, no, no, you don't have to do that. You just call yourself a Christian. You go to a Babel building, become part of a New Testament local church. I do this because that's not in the scriptures. The word church is, but having to go to a building called a church to be a Christian, that's not in the scriptures. Paul wasn't going to a Babel building called a church. He was a part of a group of a body of Christ, of believers. Okay? I want to point this out. The reason I believe Paul didn't correct King Agrippa for two reasons. Remember, he's a king. I understand that. He's a king. But Paul is bound by truth. He's already in chains for preaching truth and standing for the truth over lying. He could have lied to the people that put him in chains. You know, and he wouldn't been in chains. But he stood for the truth. Why would he all of a sudden stop standing for the truth? So when people tell you, well, he's King Agrippa, and that's why he didn't correct... No. I believe Paul did correct King Agrippa, if he was wrong. But King Agrippa, he's in chains. This is Paul in chains. King Agrippa used the title, the term Christian, properly. He was looking at Paul, the life that Paul, you want me to live the life that you're living. You want me to be a follower of Jesus Christ. You want me to suffer as you're suffering? Remember what Paul said, accept these bonds. 
You want me to suffer as you're suffering? King Agrippa used the term Christian properly. Today you have a lot of people that are all talk. Paul's in chains. He's not all talk. He's in chains. He's living the life of Christ. He's following Jesus Christ. And he's suffering for it. It's costing him. Brothers and Christ, as we get to the last one here, my push for you is, is when someone uses the term Christian, don't get all angry, don't get frustrated, don't get upset, don't get um, offended. You're just going to have to take time to talk about what a real Christian is. I've had lost, I've lost family members that call, say, oh, I'm a Christian too. And I said, okay, it's something you're called, you don't call yourself. Are you living a life of Christ? Did you truly go through the true plan of salvation? Are you following the real Jesus Christ and living for Him and following His commands? You are my friends, if you do whatsoever I command you. If a man love me, he will keep my words. Sanctify him through thy truth, thy word is truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man come to the Father but by me. You have to take, back in Paul's day, back here, it wasn't as perverted. But over time, no matter what word you try to grab from the Bible and try to use properly, the lost world's going to eventually pervert it. In Paul's day, probably was, he, there were some false converts, people claiming to be Christians that weren't. Uh, he talks about that. But as a whole, I think the, the term, the title Christian, was used mostly properly in his time. It wasn't as perverted as it is today. So today, we have to go a step further and have to explain what a real Christian is. If that's what you got to do, then that's what you got to do. I don't know how, I, but I've lost count of how many times I've got to explain the true plan of salvation. People say, oh yeah, I know the gospel, oh yeah, the gospel. I have to go through the true plan of salvation, and I'm telling you about mm, six to eight out of ten times, they don't know the real gospel. They've been lied and deceived by these Babel buildings. Easy believism. Live however you want. Do whatever you want. And just call yourself a Christian. They're clueless. I have to go a step further. But do I complain about it? No. Do I whine about it? Well, I pray I don't. I might have slipped up, but because when you've had to say it a million times, you start going, oh, Lord. They don't... i, I got to tell... I'm getting, <coughs> please forgive me. You're having to tell the gospel to people that are professing to be saved. I start, you know, kind of, I, I don't want to whine or complain, but it gets frustrating when you're trying to preach the gospel to family members that you've preached the gospel to time and time again. But you're speaking to people that don't want the truth. Okay, you're striving about, now you're definitely striving about words to no profit. If you've already preached truth to somebody and they don't want it, well, I'll brush the dust off your feet. Move on to the next city. In other words, go to someone who wants the truth. I know it's very few people today want the truth, but you go on to somebody else. You don't beat a dead horse. They're dead in trespasses and sins. They don't want to truly be saved. They don't want to truly be saved. But back to the scriptures, 18, uh, Acts verses 26, chapter 26, verse 28. Remember, Paul doesn't correct him when he uses the word the title Christian. But also remember, Paul's not the one calling himself a Christian. It's something that Agrippa is implying. Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. And he's implying that Paul is a Christian, trying to convince him to be a Christian. And Paul says, not only you, but all that hear me this day. Okay? King Agrippa saw who Paul was in chains, in bonds, living for Jesus Christ, speaking the words, God's word, and living them. That's one of the true definitions of the title Christian. Something you're called and that you're living for Jesus Christ, the real Jesus Christ. Your beliefs, the life that you live, line up with Scripture. The King James Bible, God's perfect written word for the English-speaking people. Right. The third time Christians used, it's used by Peter. The first two times, it's used by Paul in his writings. Right. Then we get over to Peter. 
Okay, remember, they were called Christians first in Antioch, and somehow it made its way back to Jerusalem. Because okay? Peter was the apostle to the Jews. 1 Peter 4.12 And people, like I said, they'll strive about to... Well, you know, well, he didn't actually call himself a Christian. Remember what I said? Is there a negative side to it, or is there a positive side to it, or is it just neutral in the sense that he's stating a fact? The first time Christian was used, it was stating a fact. They were first called Christians in Antioch. It's just stating a fact. It's not saying it was positive. It's not saying it was negative. It's stating a fact. We, we learn that it's positive... When we get to Paul with King Agrippa. If you're truly living the life of Christ and you're living for the Lord and you're doing right by His Word and you're suffering for Jesus Christ and someone looks at you and calls you a Christian, that's a positive thing. That's a good thing. Today, people aren't looking at the life that you're living. They're looking to see if you're going to a Babel building and wearing a nice suit and tie and going to a Babel building. They're looking at your words, titles, okay? A true Bible-believing, God-fearing man or woman today, they're going to look at you more and say you're part of an occult than to call you Christian because Christian has been so misused and abused today and perverted. It's not something that you are called. It's something that you get to call yourself and... You don't have to live a life of Christ. You can still be worldly and look like the world, act like the world, and just say, I believe in the big guy upstairs. No, you're on your way to hell. Now, you don't have to suffer for Jesus Christ. You can make compromises and, and enjoy fun. Flesh is fun. Fun is flesh. Uh, I had a brother in Christ once when it came to Christmas. He said, there's, no, there's nothing wrong with me, my wife, and my children having fun on Christmas. After he admitted Christmas has no basis in scripture, and it's just based off of traditions of men, culture. All right? Once again, fun. You start looking like the world, you start acting like the world. They've totally perverted it, and then they'll turn around and say, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian. All right? If someone calls you a Christian because you're living for Jesus Christ and obeying his word and you're suffering for Jesus Christ, it is a positive thing. If someone sees me have, there was someone, was it the fires that came through here? There's fires that came through here. It was within four miles of my house. It was a forest fire, and a forest fire went four miles in one day, so I had to evacuate to Gold Beach. And I was there, and I opened my Bible that I had at the time. It was, wasn't this one, it was another one. And it had it all highlighted and everything. And I'm sitting there listening to when it was... Um, when it was uh, King James Video Ministries, I miss it. I wish it would go back to being King James Video Ministries. Uh, Brother Brian, when he was, this was his foundation in all matters of faith and practice, and he believed in the imminent return of Jesus Christ. I was sitting there watching his studies and getting through and trying to do, you know, the basics. I was going through uh, key scriptures. I was going through, um, you know, be a, for a new Christian. I was going through a lot of stuff all over again because I'm sitting there because I want to say, Lord, help me. Uh, gospel messages, how to, there's a lot of lost people here um, to be able to talk to them. And I'm sitting there and they looked at me and saw that because I had my Bible highlighted and was actually sitting there outside of the Bible building doing a Bible study, they looked at that and said, you got to be a pastor. You, you're a preacher, right? You're a pastor, right? And at the time, I wasn't doing anything on YouTube, making videos or anything. It's like, they're visual. Right? They weren't looking at me saying, hey, you're a pastor. or you're, like, you're, They weren't saying you're a Christian because of the life that you're living. They were looking at, like, do you have a nice suit and tie on? Are you going to a Babel building? Are you do then you must be a Christian. You must be a Christian. That's not the definition of what a Christian is. Okay. A pastor, when you look in here, um, bishop, deacon, and then there's the word pastors used in the Bible. One of the Old Testament books I love is The, the Preacher. Uh, the, um, my brain froze. But uh, they didn't call me that because the life I was living is the point I'm trying to make, brothers is Christ. 
So I had to sit there and explain to him that I was a Bible-believing, God-fearing man, and that I believe that God really put on my heart that when you get saved, you really need to get into the Bible, you need to study it, you need to hide God's Word in your heart. I had to start going through hardcore explaining almost everything to him because they were professing Christians that were lost and on their way to hell. I didn't get mad at him. How dare you call me a pastor when I'm not a pastor? How dare you, you know, call me a Christian? They eventually thought I would use the word Christian. And I'm not, yeah, I didn't get upset at him. I didn't get angry. I just had to go, I just had to go further and do more work than I should have because of how it's been perverted and have to explain what a real Christian is and what I was, a Bible-believing, God-fearing man. I love that term, Bible-believing. In other words, if you truly believe in the Word of God, which is found in the King James Bible for English-speaking people, it's going to reflect in the life that you live. And you're going to suffer for Jesus Christ because you fear God over man. You fear God over your wife or husband. You fear God over your children. You fear God over your own flesh. I want, I want, I want. Okay? Bible-believing, God-fearing is what I like to use. And then say, brothers and sisters in Christ, saved sinners. But Paul was okay with what uh, Agrippa said because he used the term Christian properly. That's why I believe he didn't correct him. Okay. I can't be 100% dogmatic, but when you look at it and how it went by, Paul didn't correct King Agrippa. But he used the term Christian properly. And Paul's saying, I don't only wish that thou would become a Christian, but all that hear me this day. Okay. And people will fight that. Why fight it? Just, brother says, you need to fight the truth. When they just say Christian, okay, we need to take time to go a step further and explain what a real Christian is according to the scripture. It's just going to, it's going to, it's going to be monotonous. I hope I'm using that word properly. It's going to get monotonous because you're trying to, you're explaining yourself over and over and over and over to sometimes to the same people multiple times. But you got to get to a point where you move on to someone else who wants the truth. But you see what I'm saying? It does get frustrating when people are used just call you a Christian because you because when they look at me and go, Oh, you're a Christian, so what what church do you go to? They automatically assume that if you, because your title is a Christian, that you have to be going to these Bible buildings. That's the lie of the world. That's where traditions of men and rudiments of the world come in. Traditions of men. It's not based off the scriptures. Right? 1 Peter 4.12. Now we're going to look at Peter. Christian, the term Christian finally dwindles down to Jerusalem and makes its way to Jerusalem. And Peter is going to use the word Christian. 1 Peter 4.12. We start so far back for a reason because I want to drive it in that when Peter uses it, he's mainly focusing on suffering as a Christian. If you suffer for him, you shall also reign with him. If you deny him, he also will deny you. And what that's talking about is in your life as a Christian, you can fall away from Christ and start denying Him in the life that you're living, especially if you deny His imminent return. You deny Him in the life that you're living, He will also deny you. Millennial inheritance, millennial reign, okay, rewards in heaven, the judgment seat of Christ. You'll miss out on rewards because you're not living the life of Christ. You're denying Him in the life that you're living. Okay, But if you suffer for Him, that means you're not denying Him. You're suffering for Him. And that's what Peter's going to get into and talk to him. Beloved, this is Peter speaking. And he's speaking to the Jews. I believe first, second, uh, Peter are to the, Jew, uh, the Jews. Okay. Whether they be saved Jews, Christian Jews, because it starts out, it's, it's a whole other study, but first and second Peter, I believe if you go through, it's, it's not in chronological, it's, I'd about to say it's not in chronological order, but what I mean is, is it's in different dispensations. It goes through different dispensations. By the time you get to the end of 2 Peter, it's talking about a new heaven and a new earth. So it's going to go through this present day for the Jews, for the Jews, and some things are going to overlap with us, but it's predominantly addressed to the Jews. And then it starts talking about the Jews in the time of Jacob's trouble. Then it starts talking about the Jews in the thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ. And then it talk, starts talking about, at the end, the new heaven and the new earth. Okay, it's different dispensations that's going through here, so be careful trying to grab something from First and Second Peter that's not found somewhere else. Okay, but you see the word beloved. Peter's talking to the Jewish people. 
Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. Fiery trial makes, makes me think the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay? Um, when we get saved, uh, the, tri the fire that we're going to have, our works are going to go through fire at the judgment seat of Christ. Okay, our faith is going to get tried uh, in this life. Are you going to suffer for Jesus Christ or are you going to compromise and you're going to start taking the easy path? In other words, looking like the world, acting like the world, right? allowing things to happen that you should be standing against, but you're going to keep your yaps shut because you don't want to make waves. Yeah. Verse 13. But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings. Right? Christ's sufferings. That when his glory shall be revealed, when he comes back at the end of the time of Jacob's trouble, when the day of the Lord starts, the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, that's why it's Christian, Christ with an um, A-I-N. Okay. If you get reproached for the name of Christ, happy are you. One of the brothers in Christ that was in ministry there for a while, I kept trying to remind him, and I'm trying to remind myself too, that when bad things happen, when you suffer reproach, not because of your own faults, not because of your sins, your failings, uh, your your backbiting and whispering and arguing and striving about words to no profit. In other words, where you're at fault and you're suffering, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about when you suffer for Jesus Christ, you preach the truth and people start calling you names on YouTube. People start making videos attacking you. When they're not attacking you, they're attacking the Word of God. They're attacking Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. We're to praise God when we suffer for Jesus Christ. Paul, Peter, John... When they're beaten in, in prison, they're singing hymns and they're praising God. There was a brother in Christ that started losing his temper on camera and started getting mad and taking it personally like it's they're attacking me personally and how dare they attack me? I'm an elder, which he's not. Uh, he might be old, but he's not an elder. Remember, or elders ordained. Okay. Uh, I'm a bishop, I'm a deacon, I'm a special man, and I deserve to be treated better. He started getting really into that. And he forgot to do this right here. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. There was no happiness, no joy in that man. And it's not just that one man that I'm pointing out. There's a lot of brethren that get into it where they start getting into the fighting, they start getting into the arguing, and they start taking things personally as if, if you know, how dare they say that about me? How dare they say that about my Lord and Savior? Happy are you. If you're living a life of Christ and you're standing for Jesus Christ and His perfect written word, and they're attacking you, and they're mocking you, and they're name-calling, and they're bearing... I have, People out there bearing false witness about me. And they're bearing false witness about you. Sing hymns. Praise the Lord. Happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. Evidence of you being a Christian. On their part, he is evil spoken of. Oh, I, that, that, he says he's a Bible-believing, God-fearing man, but he's just part of an occult. That Jesus, he, that Jesus of his, he doesn't exist. Yeah. But on your part, he is glorified. And that's what angers him. That's why people, my family think I'm part of an occult, and now they're trying to be nice about it. Oh, we're all Christians. We're just, we're just going about it our own way. You can be as gods, knowing good and evil. They're having the attitude that, Christianity is whatever you want it to be. You can make it whatever you want it to be. They're part of the perversion of the word Christian and Christianity. They don't have a foundation. And they will speak ill of you. I have brothers in Christ that have spoken ill of me. And at first, I failed this and got angry with the Lord. I got angry with those brethren. I got angry, period. 
How could he? How could he lie about me like that? How could he bear false witness? Why is he backbiting? Why won't he come talk to me? Lord, I'm living the life of Christ. I'm a light for the Lord and his word. And it's upsetting that person, that brother in Christ. It's upsetting my lost family members. But on your part, he is glorified. I have no problem with being called a Christian. However, in these last days, I have to explain to said person what a Christian is according to the scriptures. We haven't got to the part where Paul, uh, Peter uses the word Christian yet, but I have to keep uh, saying that. When someone uses the word Christian, I have to always go back to the scriptures and say, this is what the three parts of a Christian is. It's something you're called. It's because you're living your life, your actions and your words line up, and you're living the life of Christ. People look at you and go, oh... He's a follower of Jesus Christ. And the third thing that we're reading here is talking about suffering. And because you follow Jesus Christ and you are called by somebody else a Christian, you're suffering for it. They can see the suffering. All right. Verse 15, But let none of you suffer as a murderer. See, even Peter has to separate it. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief or as an evildoer, or as a busybody, and other men's matters. In other words, there's reason, there's times that you are going to suffer because you are screwing up, brothers and sisters in Christ. You are making mistakes. You are making bad decisions. You're falling into temptation and sin. Okay? You're doing what's wrong. And you're going to suffer for it. If you're not eating right, you're going to suffer for it. There's things that you will do because it's your fault that you'll suffer. And Paul or Peter is saying, i got to make a distinction. I'm not talking about that. Because today, look at the lost world, brother says Christ. I've come across these professing Christians, not according to the scriptures, according to the lost world. And they'll talk about all this suffering that they're suffering. And if you actually listen and, fall, and, and you're like, no, you're suffering because of you. That's you. That's your fault. You're not suffering for Jesus Christ. You're conforming to the world. You're loving the world. You're compromising. You're living by the flesh. You are suffering because of you. Not for Jesus Christ. Peter makes a distinction between the two. And brother says Christ... I pray in your life that you make the distinction in your life. There's times that you suffer in your life and you've got to realize and admit, I'm suffering because I screwed up. Whether it's sin or you made a bad decision. Okay, the wrong decision. And God can pick you back up and put you back together. Okay. But Paul, uh, Peter, sorry i got to say it right, Peter is making a distinction. Yet, verse 16, yet... If any man suffer as a Christian, he already, uh, we already read that, in so much as ye are partakers of Christ's suffering. That's what it means to suffer as a Christian. You're suffering for Jesus Christ. Loneliness is a, is a big way you're going to suffer because you're not going to have much in common anymore with the lost world. Lost family members, lost friends. You're going to end up being lonely in these last days. Right? Uh, it's gonna, you're, you're gonna, I, don't, I go to town to do some shopping and that's it. Food and clothing, uh, stuff for the chickens, for the garden, um, for the house, stuff around the house. Been having some work done on the house lately. Um, there's times where I have to run in town to grab something, but I don't get to hang out in public that much anymore. Other than to hang, hand out gospel tracts and leave gospel tracts places. But I'm talking about when I was lost, I loved going downtown and going through shops and talking to strangers about worldliness and worldly things and just talk to people. Now when I go try to talk to him, I'm sorry I'm not into that. Sorry that I gave that up. Oh no, I don't do that because that's a sin. And and you know I've had, it always comes down to preaching Jesus Christ. I've got to preach Jesus Christ to him. Where when I was lost, who cares? I was a professing Christian when I was lost, and I didn't I didn't pre preach Jesus to anybody, unless they went out of their way to really push me on the issue. But I didn't take that step to say, let me tell you about my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I just, I call myself a Christian, went to the Bible buildings, like, like all these other professing, that's why we call them professing Christians. They profess to be Christians. They're not called Christians by someone who's reading the Bible saying, that person follows Jesus Christ. 
Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. Here's the big thing. This is why this is a correction to some brother in Christ that I love. Brothers out there that are getting upset, they're getting ashamed at being called a Christian. If you suffer as a Christian, or you get called a Christian properly, like King Agrippa did to Paul, uh, Paul you're not to be ashamed. Let him not be ashamed. If you're suffering for Jesus Christ, you're supposed to give God glory and give God praise, sing Him. Don't get bent out of shape, get angry, get bitter, get hateful, get spiteful. Here it is. Be, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. Glorify God. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God, and at first begin at us, what shall the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved. So that's the big thing. I didn't deserve to be saved. I asked God to save me. I came broken in true biblical repentance. I believed in the real Jesus Christ and in the finished work of Jesus Christ. In other words, I gave the old man at the foot of the cross. Lord, take this man. He's worthless. This man right here, take him. He's worthless. He's no good. Lord, I need you. Only you can save me. Only you can give me a new life. The time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God, and first begin at us, what shall the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? And for righteous scarcely be saved. Scarcely. I almost lost my train of thought. Scarcely be saved is what I'm trying to point out. This man's no good. When you talk to someone that says, I barely made it in. God had such mercy and such grace for me. He saved me. He gave me a new life. I'm a new creature in Christ Jesus. It's only by God's grace and God's mercy that I made it in. Scarcely be saved. When you have someone say, I believed. I believed. Faith alone. Faith alone. I believed. And you see a lot of pride. You see a lot of arrogance. You see a lot of me, myself, and I. It's what I did. They scarcely be saved. Where sh shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? The person who obeys not the gospel of Jesus Christ. They're going to appear at the judgment seat. Uh, the great white throne is where they're going to appear. Saved at the judgment seat of Christ, lost at the great white throne. They're going to stand before Jesus, and they're not going to have His blood covering their sin, washing. I'm sorry, co not covering, but washing their sins away. Why? Because they were told, "I can just take the title Christian for myself and have a free pass to heaven and be part of a group, a religious group." and live however I want to live, and continue living in sin. The Bible talks about sin for a season. You think you're getting away with it, but you're not. Where shall the sinner appear? Well, every knee shall bow, and every tongue shall confess, so then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God, the Bible says. Everyone has to give an account of himself to God. Everyone. And that's another thing that you'll see with these professing Christians. They're not living a life like they're going to have to answer to God someday. They believe, oh, I've got my free pass. I'm free. I can do whatever I want, whenever I want. And I'm just going to heaven and just... And you, you talk to them, it's like they have nothing, nothing. They don't present this attitude or this even this thought that, you're going to have to answer to God someday. Even as a saved sinner, you're going to have to stand before Jesus Christ. Your Lord, it's supposed to be your Lord and Savior, your Creator, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, God manifest in the flesh, God Almighty. And you're going to have to answer for your life as a Christian. But that's not taught with this easy believism, this faith alone. They take that out because that goes against their whole belief of, it's just faith alone, and i got a free pass, and I can do whatever I want and live however I want. Where the ungodly and the sinner appear? And that's what frustrates some of the brethren. Or I just want to say this. They're justifiably frustrated when it comes to the term and title Christian because it's being so misused. I've said this before. If it was just about a profession and not living for Jesus Christ and suffering for Jesus Christ like we read in the Scriptures... 
what was it? I lost it now. It's like 70 or 80 percent of the world believes in a Jesus Christ. And a lot of them like to call themselves Christians or a type of Christian. Over 80 percent. I can't remember if it was 70 or 80 percent, but it was, a, it was a large number. Now, some of them believe in a Jesus Christ that's not God manifest in the flesh. Some believe that he's an angel manifest in the flesh. Uh, some believe he was just a prophet. Uh, some believe, you know, but they believe in a Jesus Christ. And remember, the, ter the title Christian came from those who suffer, the partakers of Christ's suffering. There's one meter between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. Verse 19, Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God, if you're suffering according to the will of God, commit to the keeping of their souls to Him in well-doing as unto a faithful Creator. Don't be one of those people that compromises. Don't be one of those people that start getting all bent out of shape. Are you ashamed of being called a Christian? Paul wasn't. Why? Because, like I said, I believe King Agrippa was using the term properly, the title Christian properly. Are you ashamed of the suffering as a Christian? Are you ashamed that you suffer as a Christian? Not just being called a Christian because of the life you're living, but you're, you're being called a Christian because they see the suffering that you're suffering for Jesus Christ. Are you ashamed to suffer for Jesus Christ? Peter wasn't. To be a Christian according to the scriptures, which can be found in the King James Bible for English-speaking people, not the Bible perversions out there, but God's perfect written word, it means being a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is come in the flesh, who is the capital L Lord. It means suffering for Jesus Christ. When you live for him, you're going to suffer for him. And it's something that someone else calls you. You're living for Him, you're suffering for Him, just talking about the two things. Then people look at those two things and they call you a Christian. It's something that you were called based off of those two things. Living for Him and suffering for Him. The real Jesus Christ. A lot of people don't like it, but the real Jesus Christ has a zero tolerance for sin. The fake Jesus Christ, what I call the ant, it's an antichrist, it's Satan posing as Jesus Christ and getting people to call themselves Christians and worship him as God. Uh, he loves, he's okay with sin. Yeah, he said, you know, sin can be, it's wrong, it's bad, yeah, but it's, people get so bent out of shape over sin. I mean, those so-called Bible-believing, God-fearing men and women out there getting so bent out of shape, they're just getting too bent out of shape. They need to have more grace. They need to have more mercy. We're supposed to have a zero tolerance for sin as Jesus did. Jesus said, be holy for I am holy. Be followers of me as I am of Christ, Paul says. We're supposed to have a zero tolerance for sin. Yes, we're supposed to have grace. Yes, we're supposed to have love. But remember, judgment. Those three things that we read. Read them again. From, uh, says, uh, Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye pay tithe of mint, in other words, money, people can buy their way out of, you know, sin and judgment, and Ananias and Cummins, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law. What's the weightier matters of the law? Judgment, mercy, and faith. Ye blind guides would strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. Judgment, mercy, and faith. Yes, we're supposed to have mercy for those who repent who turn from their wicked ways. But that judgment still needs to be there. And what the, the easy believism people like to do, they like to take the judgment away. There shouldn't be any judgment. There should only be mercy. Oh, you need to forgive him. Well, did he repent and turn from his wicked ways? Oh, no, he didn't repent. But you need to forgive him. Chapter and verse on that? Chapter and verse on that? No, you forgive them when they turn from their wicked ways. That's where the mercy comes in. And yes, we need to have more mercy and not hold things past mistakes against brethren that have repented and turned from their wicked ways. We do need to have grace and mercy. Okay. Um, Now, the three mentions of the word Christian, we're going to wrap this up. The three mentions of the word Christian is capitalized. It is a title. 
That's one thing we can say as a title. The number one reason I use Bible believing, God fearing is because Christian, the title, I put in parentheses, the title Christian, it's in the scriptures, but the title Christian has been perverted by the lost world. When the lost world hits me up with the word Christian, the title Christian, I have to go through and explain to them what a real Christian is according to the scriptures, and they're oblivious to it. They're clueless. And I hate being yoked up with them, and people think that I'm part of them, and I'm not. And I don't want people thinking they're a part of us, and they're not. It's the reason why I don't like it. So here's the thing. If you don't want to use the term Christian, the title Christian, okay, I understand. I understand. It's been so perverted today. But please, 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 don't get into arguments, don't get into debates, and don't get into fighting, getting all bent out of shape for some of us who do still use the the, the title Christian properly. And we have to correct the lost world when they misuse the word Christian. Okay? But like I said, I like Bible believing, God fearing. That's why a Bible believer lives a life of Christ. And someone who fears God is going to suffer for Jesus Christ because they're going to stay true to the Word of God because they fear Him. And they're not going to compromise and try to get out of suffering for Jesus Christ. Okay? I fear more, I fear God more than I fear what man's capable of doing. Remember what uh, Jesus was telling him, fear, fear not him that's able to destroy the body, but fear him that's able to destroy both body and soul in hell. There's nothing in this, war, this life that I'm living that this lost world can do to me that can compare with it, what God's going to do to them. If they continue to reject Jesus Christ and go to hell to burn for all eternity. It's nothing you look at all the saints of the past, you look at all the brothers and sisters of Christ, the martyrs, what they had to go through, the torture, you think, man, that's bad. That's bad. It's nothing compared to what God is going to do to the lost world Jesus, through Jesus Christ. Remember, all judgment has been given to the Son from the Father. Judgment is going to be God the Father, the soul is going to give judgment through the body, Jesus Christ, His Son, the Son of God. It's nothing compared to what's he, what God is going to do through Jesus Christ to the lost world. It's nothing. That's why we fear God over fearing man. And sometimes you can forget to fear God and you start getting into flesh and you start getting into worldliness. Brother, sister Christ, get back to fearing God. Get back to living for Him. Get back to being that um, when someone looks at you and says Christian, it's being used properly. That's a good way to say it. But don't get into a fight and don't get bent out of shape. Okay, brother Jesus Christ, if you don't want to use the word, the title Christian, fine. But please take time to correct the lost world when they're misusing Christian. Take time. Don't do it with anger. Don't do it with bitterness. Don't be ashamed of the word Christian. Just set the record straight through the word of God. Set the record straight. This is what a real Christian is according to the scriptures. I'll go it one last time. It's something that you're called. And why are you called it? Because you're living a life of Christ. And you're, because you're living a life of Christ, Bible believing, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Sanctify thy truth, thy word is truth. Because you are living a life of Christ, Bible believing, you're going to suffer for Jesus Christ. Because you're going to fear God more than you're going to fear this world and what this world can do to you. And you're going to suffer for Jesus Christ. And because of those two things, somebody, whether it's a saved person or it's a lost person, is going to look at these two things and say, and call you a Christian. It's something that you are called. It's not something you call yourself. See, I've made that mistake. I've made that mistake. So, brothers and sisters Christ, this will be the, it for this part. Uh, the term Christian, is it worth fighting for? The real Fighting for those three things that define what a Christian is, that's worth fighting for. But fighting over people who use it properly uh, and just fighting amongst the Christians, oh, we should never use the word Christian, that's not there in Scripture. Be very careful that you're not getting so bent out. I'll sit here and I will fight for what the real Christian is according to the Scriptures, but I'm not going to get into an argument with someone saying, oh, we should never use Christian. Christian's a derogatory term and chapter and verse on that. You won't find it in Scripture. Uh, and Christians shouldn't be used, and, and you're in sin if you use Christian, and, and you're not right with the Lord, and you don't line up with Scripture if you use the word Christian. Where's that at in Scripture? 
You're starting a fight that's not worth fighting. You're fighting the wrong fight. Okay, the real fight is saying, hey, being positive, praising the Lord, and saying, hey, this is what a real Christian is, and praise the Lord for all the Christians out there. And I praise the Lord for all the Christians out there. True Christians, according to the scriptures. All right? Remember, Paul was not ashamed to be called a Christian, and Peter comes out and says he's not ashamed to suffer as a Christian. Are you ashamed to be called a Christian? Are you ashamed to suffer as a Christian? When you set the lost world straight on what a real Christian is, they are ashamed to suffer as a Christian, and they are ashamed to be called a real Christian according to the scriptures. That's why they like the perverted version of the word Christian. A perverted version. Okay. So grace and peace from God. We're going to get into some other things. The next part we're going to go into is... Uh, what to call? Well, we can't call each other Christians. You can. You can call someone a Christian. Just be careful that you're not calling yourself a Christian. That's, you know, that's something I, another brother in Christ should do. But what should we call each other then? We get so caught up on what words we should use now all of a sudden because people have taken this and blown it out of proportion and fighting it in a wrong way. So we'll get into another part. And we're going to be talking about, you know, uh, how did P Paul address the Christians. And we're going to go through and we're going to talk about some of these things. And God showed me some things in it. So we'll end with um, grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And my love for you which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So thank you for watching and please take this with grace. And please take this. Do understand I'm not fighting you. If you don't want to use the word Christian, fine. If you want to use the word Christian, make sure you're doing it properly. That's the only thing I have to say. Make sure you're using it properly and you're defending it when the lost world's using it wrong. Take time to defend it when the lost world's using it wrong. If you choose not to want to use it, fine. You don't have to use it. You don't have to. Okay? But don't get distracted into fighting and bickering and arguing over brethren using it properly. Okay? And brethren that still want to use the, the, the title Christian and use it properly. So grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all and my love for you which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next video.